I'm Susan Danoff, and I feel very privileged to be here today to share stories at a poetry festival. And I feel privileged because I respect poetry very much, and I'm very grateful that the people who organized this festival felt that storytelling belongs here as well. And I think the reason it belongs is because not that long ago in human history, people didn't write. They only had their voices to tell. And I think a long time ago, probably the storytellers and the poets were the same people. In my programs that I'll be doing in the next few days here, I have different themes. And one of the themes that's been on my mind recently is the theme of vision. And I think one of the things that poetry does is it gives us a vision. And the stories that I'd like to share with you today are all about people in very different situations who have a vision, and they're four very different kinds. Um, as I just mentioned, if you'd like to move up closer, please do. The first story that I'd like to tell you comes from India. It's from a very, very long book, the longest epic in world literature called the Mahabharata. And this is a very little story in that book and it's called Savitri. There was once a king who was wise and virtuous in all ways, but he had one great sadness in the world, for he and his wife had no children. He fasted and he prayed, and he fasted and he prayed, and often he prayed to the goddess Savitri that she would grant them a son or a daughter. And after 17 years, the goddess Savitri appeared to them in a fire, and she said, Soon a daughter will be born to you. And nine months later, his wife gave birth to a daughter, and they named her Savitri after the goddess. As she grew, no one would, could say if she was more good than she was beautiful or more beautiful than she was good. But when it was time for her to be married, no one came to ask for her in marriage. Now, the king could not understand this, and he sent his courtiers out to find out why. And they came back, and they said, all of the young men in the kingdom fear to marry Savitri because they think that she is a goddess. The king called Savitri to her, to him then, and he said, Savitri, I want you to go out into the world and find your husband. And he sent men to accompany her, and she was gone a long time. But one day, Aswapati was in conference with the wise man of the kingdom, a man named Narada, and Savitri came back. And he said, Have you found your husband? Yes, she said, I have found him. His name is Satyavan. I found him in the forest, and he is a prince in spirit as well as in lineage, for his father was once a king. But he became blind, and in his blindness his kingdom was taken from him. As Savitri spoke, the wise man Narada looked more and more worried, and he said, I know the man your daughter speaks of. He has the energy of the sun, the courage of the gods, and is forgiving as the earth itself. But he has one great fault that blinds all of the others, and for this, you must not marry him. And Aswapati could not understand this. He said, you speak of every virtue. What could this fault be? And Narada said, One year from today, Satyavan is destined to die. You must go back and choose someone else. But Savitri didn't seem to hesitate for a moment, he, and she said, No. He is my husband. He is the only man that I will marry. And when Aswapati realized that she would not change her mind, he said, All right. 
and he went with her into the forest. And when Satyavan's parents saw her, they said, we knew as soon as we met her that she would be our daughter-in-law. We ask only that she stay with us. And Aswapati agreed. They were married, and they were very, very happy. But every day, Savitri grew sadder in the privacy of her own heart, and she counted the days until Satyavan was to die. Four days before he was to die, she took a vow. She would neither eat nor sleep, but spent all of her time in prayer because she knew that one of ascetic merit could see and hear what other people cannot see and hear. Her husband's parents could not understand that. And they said, what have you done to deserve this? But all that she would say was, I have taken a vow. On the day he was to die, Savitri asked his parents for permission to go with him into the forest. And since she had never before made one request, they said she could. They walked through the forest, and it was as always. But suddenly, Satyavan said, I am dizzy. I feel something is piercing my head. And he lay down and put his head in her lap. He fell asleep. And when she looked up, she saw a huge man, all dressed in red, with flaming eyes and a crown on his head. She stood up and said, Who are you? My child, he said, if you can see me, you must indeed have great ascetic merit, and so I will tell you. I am Yama, Lord of the dead, and I have come today for your husband. And he took out a noose, and he extracted the soul of Satyavan from his body, and all the color drained from his face, and his chest no longer rose and fell with its breath. Yama walked away, and Savitri walked behind him. He was pleased with her conversation because most are afraid of him. And he said, My child, I admire your courage. Ask a boon from me, anything but the life of your husband, for that I cannot give you. And she said, Lord Yama, please grant that the sight of my father-in-law be returned to him. It is granted. Now return. But still, she followed after him. Savitri, he said, I admire your constancy. Ask another boon from me, anything but the life of your husband. Lord Yama, please, grant that my father-in-law's kingdom be returned to him. It is granted. Now return. But still, she followed after him. Servitri, he said, I admire your filial piety. Now ask one more boon from me, but this time ask something for yourself. Lord Yama, she said, grant that I may bear many children in my life. It is granted. Now return. But Savitri stood where she was. Lord Yama, she said, a Hindu woman may marry only once. Lord Yama hesitated for a moment, and then he loosened the noose around Satyavan's soul, and he said, in such a way do the gods like to be defeated by mortals. Now return. And this time she returned. And when she came back, she looked at her husband, and the color flowed back into his face, and his chest began to rise and fall. And when he opened his eyes, he said, Why, I seem to have been sleeping for a long time, and I had the strangest dream. I dreamt that a man all dressed in red came to take me away. 
That was no dream, my husband. Come with me, for it is late, and your parents will be worried, and I will tell you what happened. And Savitri told him all that had happened, and everything that Lord Yama granted came to pass. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a long history in Jewish mysticism. And in the 16th century, there was a man named Isaac Loria, also known as the Ari, who lived in the Holy Land. And it, he, there are many stories about him being able to see things that other people couldn't see. And so he fits into this theme of visionaries. This is a story called Hollas in the Ark, and I'd like to explain some of the words that some of you might not be familiar with. Hala is bread made on the Sabbath. In the synagogue, which is also called the shul or the temple, there's a place called the Ark, and the Ark is where the Holy Scrolls are kept. The person who keeps the synagogue clean and takes care of things is called the shamus. And I think those are the only words that you need to know to make sense of this story. It comes from a book called Gates to the New City by Howard Schwartz. And Zalman Schachter, who was a rabbi in Philadelphia, wrote this version of the story. There are other versions as well. In the 16th century, the Jews were forced to leave Spain, and they went to many places. They went to Germany and France and Greece, and some of them went to the Holy Land. There was one couple, Jacobo and Esperanza, and they went to the city of Sfat in the Holy Land, where mysticism flourished. Now, they were observant Jews, and they went to temple every Sabbath. But Spanish was their language, and they didn't understand everything of the Hebrew they heard. But one day, Jacobo thought he heard the rabbi say that in the days of the holy temple in Jerusalem, God was given 12 loaves of bread. And he said to himself, God likes bread. And he went home, and he said to his wife Esperanza, You'll never believe what I heard the rabbi say today. God likes bread. You make the best challah. This Shabbos, I want that you should make a dozen loaves of your best challah for God. So on Thursday, she kneaded the dough extra fine, and early Friday morning she baked it. And he wrapped it in a white tablecloth, and on Friday morning, he took it to the synagogue. Now he looked around to make sure no one was there, and then he went up to the ark, he kissed the curtain, opened it up, and spoke to God. Señor Dios, I hear you like bread. My esperanza makes the best challah. Now I am going to leave 12 loaves of bread, just like in the olden days. And I want tomorrow when I come to shul to see that you ate every crumb. And he laid the 12 loaves in Bueno appetito. He closed the curtain, walked back seven steps, and left the synagogue. A little while later, the shamus came in. The shamus was sweeping, and then he stopped sweeping so that he could talk to God. And he said, Dear Lord, two weeks and I haven't been paid. I have five children. What am I supposed to do? I know you could say I should get another job, but the only thing I ever wanted to do was to work in your house. You make miracles. I'll tell you what. Right now, I am going to walk over to the ark, and I want that you should make me a miracle. And he went over to the ark. He kissed the curtain. He opened it. You heard me. I know I'm just a little shamus, but you heard me. Thank you so much. And he took the 12 loaves and he rushed home. 
The next morning, Jacobo and Esperanza came to synagogue for services. And Jacobo couldn't wait until the rabbi was to open up the ark. And as the rabbi was going to open it, he crept up nearby so he could see. And when he saw it was all gone, every crumb, he winked up to Esperanza in the balcony so she should know. And he said the next week he wanted her to make another 12 loaves. And he took it, and the shamas found it. And this went on, and the shamas realized that if he hung around the synagogue, no bread. If he came too early, no bread. But if he came just at the right time, there were his 12 loaves of bread. This went on for 30 years. <laughs> now, in the 30th year, this particular rabbi was now 90 years old. He'd given that sermon when he was 60. And in this year, Jacobo came in one day. He opened the curtain, and he said, Senor Dios, I don't know if you noticed, but recently the bread has been a little lumpy. My Esperanza has arthritis. If you don't like the lumps, maybe you could do a little something for Esperanza's arthritis. But anyway, bueno apetito, enjoy. And he put in the 12 loaves of bread, kissed the curtain. He was walking back, his customary seven steps, when the long, bony hand of the rabbi reaches out and grabs him. What do you think you're doing? I'm leaving Gladys. His pan de Dios, his weekly bread. What are you talking about? God doesn't eat. Senora Dino, I know you're much smarter than me, but God does too eat. Thirty years he's been eating my bread. Well, I don't know about that. Let's see. So the rabbi hides behind the pew with Jacobo, and they wait. And after a little while, the shamus comes in, goes up. Dear Lord, there's something I think you should know. There's something funny about the angels up there recently. The bread has been a little lumpy. But anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you. I just thought you should know. He took out the loaves, clo closed the curtain. He was walking back when the rabbi grabs his collar and says, What do you think you're doing? Because of you, this other man has sinned. Thinking God is a man is a sin. What? But God gives me the bread every week. You don't pay me, God pays me. And suddenly, everybody's standing there, and they all realize what's happened. And Jacobo starts crying because he only wanted to do good. And the shaman starts crying because he knows he won't get his bread anymore. And the rabbi's crying because all this crazy stuff is going on in his synagogue. And just then, a messenger comes from Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Ari. And he says, the Ari wishes to see all three of you right now. And they go to his house. First, he turns to the rabbi and he says, go home and prepare to die. You are going to die before the Sabbath is out. And do you know why you're going to die? I'll tell you. For 30 years, God has not had so much fun as he's had during the time of the Holy Temple until now, when every Friday he's been watching what goes on in your synagogue. One man comes and brings the challah. The other man comes and takes the challah. And God gets all the credit. He and his angels have been watching this for 30 years, so he called off the angel of death. You were supposed to die 30 years ago. So go home, because you've spoiled all God's fun. And then he turned to Jacobo, and he said, Jacobo, I want you to know with perfect faith that if you give the challah directly to the shamas, God will be pleased. Know that. One of my favorite stories that I've ever read. And one of the reasons that I like the story so much is because 
every time I tell it, it teaches me something. And I think it has so much to teach me that um, I imagine it will always have more to teach me for the rest of my life. And I think it's, it's a very wonderful gift to find a story like that. It's an American Indian story. It comes from, the, this particular version comes from a book called Seven Arrows by a Native American named Hayamio Storm. Um, he's a Cheyenne Indian. And it is the story of Jumping Mouse. There was once a little mouse. He was much like other mice, always scurrying about, looking for mice things. But sometimes he thought he heard a roaring in his ears. And he would go to one of his brothers and he would say, My brother, do you hear a roaring in your ears? A roaring in your ears? What are you talking about? But still, he heard the roaring in his ears. And he went to another of his brothers and he said, My brother, do you hear a roaring in your ears? A roaring. What is a roaring? But still, he heard the roaring in his ears. And one day, he decided that he must investigate it. Now, this was a dangerous thing for a little mouse to do. He'd never gone away from the place where all the other mice lived, but he was determined to find out. So very carefully, he began to walk away from the place that he was used to when he heard a voice say, Hello, little brother. And he was about to run away. It is I, brother raccoon. Oh, oh hello, brother raccoon. Where are you going, little brother? He was a little embarrassed, but he said, I, I, I heard a roaring, and I'm going to investigate it. What you hear, little brother, is the river. What is a river? Come, and I will show you the river, said Raccoon. Thank you, my brother. And little mouse followed Raccoon to the river. And when he got there, he couldn't believe his eyes. It was the vastest and the greatest thing he'd ever seen. And it moved. And there were so many things floating on it. And Raccoon said, I will leave you now, my brother, but Frog is here and he will answer any questions you have. Thank you, thank you, my brother. And he was so fascinated by this thing in front of him. And when he looked in, he saw a very frightened mouse. Who are you? he asked. And Frog said, that is your reflection. All things are reflected in the great river. And Frog asked him, Little Mouse, would you like some medicine power? Medicine power? For me? Yes. Yes, I would. Then crouch as low as you can and jump as high as you are able and you shall have your medicine. And Little Mouse crouched as low as he could and he jumped. And when he jumped, he saw the sacred mountains. And then he fell back down and he tumbled into the water. And when he got out, he was very angry and he said, You tricked me. Do not let your fear and anger blind you. When you jumped, what did you see? I saw the sacred mountains. And they were wondrous. Yes, said Frog. And you have a new name. You are Jumping Mouse. Thank you, said Jumping Mouse. Thank you. And now I'm going to go back and tell my people so they will know too. Yes, said Frog, go back and tell your people. Just keep the sound of the river behind you and walk away from it and you will find them. And Jumping Mouse did that. But when he got there, he found only disappointment. For his brothers did not want to listen to him. They saw that he was wet even though it hadn't rained. And the only thing that could have happened was that an animal had taken him into his mouth and spat him out like poison. And they didn't want to know anything about this. But in spite of that, the memory of the sacred mountains burned in the heart of Jumping Mouse. And after a while, he wanted to see them. He knew it was dangerous for a mouse to run across the prairie because there are eagles all over the sky waiting to pounce on a little mouse. But he went out to the prairie one day 
And he went to the edge and he ran across as fast as he could. And after a little while, he ran into a brush of sage. There was an old mouse there. He said, such a place and such a mouse. You have everything here. And the eagles cannot see you either. Yes, this is a good place, said the old mouse. I can see everything of the prairie, the coyotes, the rabbits, the antelopes, everything, and the eagles cannot see me here. Can you also see the, the great river and the sacred mountains? Yes, and no. I know all about the great river, but as for the sacred mountains, they're only a myth. Only a myth, thought Chumpy Mouse. Anyone who's seen the sacred mountains knows that they are not a myth. And after a while, he said, thank you very much for giving me food to eat. I must go now. You are a foolish mouse. You could stay with me and be happy here forever. You better not go. There are eagles all over the sky, and they will catch you. This made Jumping Mouse very afraid, but he had to go, and, and he said, thank you, and he ran across the prairie again. And after a while, he came to a stand of choke cherries. There were so many wonderful smells and things to eat. And then he heard a very heavy breathing. And he went over to the place of the breathing, and there was a huge buffalo. He'd never seen such a huge creature before. It was so big he could have crawled into one of its horns. But it was panting. And he said, hello, brother. Hello, little brother. What is the matter with you? I am sick, and I am dying. And my medicine tells me that only the eye of a mouse can save me. But there is no such thing as a mouse. And Jumping Mouse ran away from the buffalo, and he thought, my eye, my tiny eyes. And his heart was beating very fast, and, and he went back to the buffalo, and he said, You are a much greater being than I am. I have two eyes. You may have one of them. And the minute he said it, his eye flew out of his head, and the buffalo stood up, and he was made whole again. Thank you, my brother, said Buffalo. We shall be brothers forever. I am the guide to the foot of the sacred mountains. You may run under me, and the eagles cannot catch you. Go under my body, and I will take you there. And Jumping Mouse went under the belly of the buffalo, and they ran together. And it was very scary for Jumping Mouse, because every time the buffalo moved his legs, Jumping Mouse's whole world shook. And it was scary, too, because he could only see with one eye, and he wasn't used to that. Then they came to the foot of the mountains, and the buffalo said, I will leave you here, little brother. But I am out on the prairie, and you know where to find me. Thank you, my brother. And thank you, said Jumping Mouse. And Jumping Mouse began to explore his new surroundings again. And again, there were so many things he'd never experienced in his whole life, and seeds to eat. And he came upon another creature, a big gray wolf. Hello, Brother Wolf. But the wolf looked very vacant. He said, oh, wolf, wolf, yes, that's what I am. And then he went back the same as he was before. Brother Wolf, 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 yes. And then there was nothing. And Jumping Mouse thought, such a great creature, yet he has no memory. And Jumping Mouse felt very scared. And he waited a few minutes. And then he went up to Wolf, and he said, My brother, 
I know what will heal you. It is one of my eyes. You are a much greater creature than I am. Take it. And his other eye flew out of him, and Wolf was whole, and he had his memory back, and the tears fell from his eyes. But Jumping Mouse could not see them, for he was blind. And Wolf said, Thank you, my brother. You have given to me, and I can take you to the great medicine lake where all things in the world are reflected. For I am the guide into the sacred mountains. Would you like me to take you there? Yes, said Jumping Mouse. And very carefully he led Jumping Mouse, for Jumping Mouse could not see, and he described everything to him. And then they came to the lake, and Jumping Mouse took a drink out of the great medicine lake. And Brother Wolf said, Thank you, my brother, for giving to me. Soon I must go back, because I am the guide into this place, and I must bring other people, but I will stay with you as long as you like. I understand, Brother Wolf, you go back. Thank you for bringing me to this place. And Wolf left. Jumping Mouse sat by the edge of the water. He couldn't go anywhere. He knew that soon an eagle would find him, but he couldn't run away, because he couldn't see. Then he heard the sound that eagles make. He felt a shadow over his head, and then eagle struck, and Jumping Mouse fell asleep. When he woke up, he opened his eyes. It was blurry. I can see. I can see, he said, but he couldn't see very clearly. And he heard another presence by him, and the voice said, Jumping Mouse. Would you like some medicine power for me? Yes, he said. Yes, I would. Then crouch as low as you can and jump as high as you are able and you will have your medicine. And Jumping Mouse crouched as low as he could and then he jumped. And the higher he went, the clearer he could see. And then he could see the sacred mountains all around him and he heard the voice say, hang on to the wind and trust, and higher and higher he went. And when he looked down, he saw Frog in the lake. And Frog called up to him, you have a new name. You are Eagle. brocade. A long time ago in southern China, when magic grew like green fields of rice, there lived a widow who had three sons. Fortunately for her sons, the widow had very special fingers, for she could weave the most beautiful brocades. She would take silk threads of every color in the rainbow, and whatever she wove, be it birds or butterflies, budding flowers or mountain scenes, People said that her brocades were even more beautiful than the real thing. One day she had finished a brocade. She took it to market to sell, and she sold it quickly because anyone who had any money wanted to buy it. And then she began to wander through the marketplace and look at the other things that people were selling. And her eye was caught by the most beautiful painting. She stopped to look at it. In the top of the painting was a bamboo forest and below that, a palace with a red tile roof and porches all around. And it overlooked a little silver fish pond, and there were birds and flowers everywhere. She looked at it for a long time. She thought it was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. So she took the money she'd just earned, she bought the painting, and she went home. She couldn't wait to show it to her three sons. And when she got home, she laid it down and she said, My sons, wouldn't it be wonderful to live in a place like this? And her first son said, Oh, mother, there is no place like this. And her second son said, Mother, that's an idle dream. But her third son understood his mother better. 
And he said, Mother, perhaps if you wove a copy of this painting into one of your brocades, you would feel as if you were living in it. Yes, she said, that's just what I'll do. And the next day she went and bought all the colored threads that she would need, and she began to weave. She wove from early morning when the sun showed its face above the lowest hill until the evening when she couldn't see the threads. But at the end of one year, she had only woven one-third of that brocade, the bamboo forest and the red tile roof. And her first two sons came to her and they said, Mother, you never finish anything anymore. You never sell anything. We have to go cut extra wood to buy your rice. But the third son said, Never mind, Mother. Finish the brocade. I will cut the extra wood. And so now she wove day and night. And she would burn pine wood at night so that she could see, but the smoke would get into her eyes, and sometimes tears would fall from her eyes. And these she wove into the silver fish pond. And still she wasn't finished after two years, and she wove a third year. And now when the smoke got into her eyes, sometimes drops of blood would fall from her eyes. And these she wove into the scarlet flowers. Finally, after three years, it was finished. She took it outside so that she could see it in the sunshine. She laid it on the ground, and as she looked at it, a wind came, and it lifted it up into the air, and it swept it to the east so fast that she couldn't catch it. And she fainted on the hillside. Her sons found her later that day, and they revived her, and she said to her eldest son, Please, will you go in search of my brocade? It means more to me than life. He agreed. He walked towards the east for four weeks. After four weeks, he reached a mountain pass. There was an old woman there who lived in a stone cottage, and in front of the stone cottage was a stone horse. She stopped him and said, Where are you going, my son? And he told her the story of his mother's brocade. I can tell you where it is, she said. The fairies of Sun Mountain have stolen your mother's brocade. They thought it was so beautiful that they're weaving copies of it. Well, how can I get it back? That will be very difficult, she said. For first, you must knock out your two front teeth and place them in the mouth of the stone horse. Then you must jump on the horse. The horse will come to life. And he will first travel over the mountain of flames. And though you will feel fire on all sides of your body, you must not utter one cry of pain. For if you do, you will be devoured by flames. And then the horse will plunge into the icy sea, and though you will feel the ice all around your body, you must not shiver once, for if you do, you will turn to ice and sink to the bottom of the sea. When the first son heard what he must do, he looked very nervous and very unsure of himself, and she said, never mind. You don't have to go. Here, take a box of gold. Here. Take a box of gold instead. And he took the box of gold and he thought, well, he was happy he'd walked all this way for a box of gold. But as he started to walk home, he thought, if I go home, I'll have to split the gold four ways. But if I go to the city, I can have it all for myself. And he turned and went to the city. His mother waited. He didn't come back. And after a while, she said to her second son, will you go in search of my brocade? And he agreed. And like his brother, he traveled four weeks to the mountain pass. And like his brother, he heard what he must do. And like his brother, he turned pale as a ghost. Here, have a box of gold. And like his brother, he went to the city. By now, the widow had grown blind from weeping. And her third son came to her and he said, mother, let me go in search of the brocade. And she agreed. He traveled more swiftly than his brothers, and in two weeks' time, he reached the mountain pass. When he heard what he must do, he didn't hesitate for a moment. He knocked out his two front teeth and placed them in the mouth of the stone horse. The horse came to life. He jumped on its back. And first, it traveled over the mountain of flames. And though he could feel the fire on all sides of his body, he kept his mouth shut. He held on to his horse, and he did not utter one cry of pain. And then the horse plunged into the icy sea, And all the fire was quenched. But suddenly he felt so cold, and he held on to that horse with his knees and his hands, and he held held his mouth clenched shut, and he did not shudder once. Then he came out of the sea, and there was a beautiful meadow, 
and at the end of the meadow was a palace. He spurred his horse on. When he reached the palace, he went inside, and there was a huge hall. In the center of the hall was his mother's brocade, and all around it were a hundred beautiful fairies, all weaving copies of it. One of them came up to him, and she said, we will be finished with your mother's brocade in the morning. Sit down, have something to eat. And he sat, and he watched them as they were. And when night came, they hung a huge pearl from the ceiling, which lit the room with a beautiful glow. And he fell asleep. One by one, all the fairies finished their brocade, until at last, there was only one fairy left. When she finished, she looked at her brocade, and she looked at the widow's brocade, and she knew that hers was just a poor copy, and she knew that she would never see the widow's brocade again. So she took a piece of red silk, and she embroidered a picture of herself into the widow's brocade, and she disappeared too. When he woke up in the morning, they were all gone, but there was his mother's brocade, he folded it up, put it inside his shirt, jumped back onto his horse, plunged into the icy sea, traveled over the mountain of flames, and was back at the widow's palace. Ah, I see you have returned. And with one quick gesture, she took the teeth from the horse's mouth and put them in the boy's mouth, and the horse turned to stone. And she went into the house, and she brought out two very soft shoes, and she said, put these on and you shall reach your home very quickly. And he put them on, and in no time at all, he was back at his mother's gate. He went inside her house, and there she was, lying on her bed. And he said, Mother, it is here. I have the brocade. And she opened her eyes, and when they fell on the shining threads, her sight was restored to her. Mother, he said, let us look at the brocade in the daylight. And they took the brocade outside, and they laid it on the ground. And as they looked at it, a very gentle wind came, and it lifted the brocade, and it spread it very wide, and it spread it very long. It spread it until it covered the whole countryside. Then all the threads quivered, and it burst into life. It was all there, the bamboo forest, the palace with the red tile roof and the porches, the little silver fish pond. But there was something there that had been, not been in the original. For the fairy, who had embroidered herself into the brocade, was now standing dressed in red beside the fish pond. The third son married the fairy, and he and his wife and his mother lived in that place for all the rest of their days. Many years later, two beggars came by, the first and the second son. They had long since squandered their money. And when they saw this beautiful place, they thought, maybe some rich person here will give us some money. But then a very strange feeling came over them, for they realized that this was their mother's brocade come to life. And they walked shamefully away. Thank you. Your listening was just wonderful. Thank you for listening so beautifully to that.